Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started because we're running a little bit late. So um, to to begin, uh, let's uh, uh, let's let's do this uh, this panel. This panel um, is um, is about plastic. It's about uh, plastic in the uh, and marine litter problem in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, we're going to kick this off with uh, with a keynote uh, by Mr. Uh, Harman Speck. Uh, he is the Innovation and Global Manager of the Plastic Soup Foundation. Um, and the Plastic Soup Foundation is based on a very simple idea, which, uh, if I understand correctly, is no more plastic in the environment. Simple enough. So uh, take it away, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, there it is. Good afternoon. Thank you for attending this session about marine plastics in the Baltic Sea. My name is Harma Speck. I'm the Innovation and Solution Manager from the Plastic Soup Foundation in the Netherlands. I'm going to tell you about plastics, related environmental problems, and solutions in a nutshell. I only have 50 minutes, or not even, for this presentation. This is way too short to highlight all topics, but I will do my best to give you a good overview. Yes. A small introduction. The Plastic Soup Foundation was founded in 2011 and started off with just a small group of volunteers with a campaign against microplastics in cosmetics. With this Beat the Microbeat campaign, we now lead a consortium of 98 NGOs in 44 countries. The results so far, most of the multinationals and hundreds of smaller brands already phased out the plastic microbeads from their products. A great result in one of the first fights against the needless use of primary microplastics. Since then, we have grown into one of the leading NGOs worldwide on the issue of plastic soup. We run a lot of projects nowadays and are also the country leader for the World Cleanup Day in the Netherlands. But let's start at the beginning. The invention of plastic has given a real boost to industrialization in the 1900s. Mass production of consumer goods was instantly possible due to this amazing new material. Markets changed from rather expensive handmade goods into buying affordable convenience for every situation. Life seemed rather simple. Even waste collection looked as an easy task. Just one bucket with mostly organic waste. The collection of waste even served local benefits. Most of the organic waste, for instance, went to livestock and cattle. That slowly changed after the Second World War, when there was a big need for more convenient products with the start of a new period of growth that was mentioned in Life magazine as throw away living. This is the point in history where plastic became a major part of household waste, what formed the beginning of centralized waste management. In that time, Plastic packaging was promoted as a primary good. You can even wrap your babies in it. Clearly, it was seen as the miracle material of that moment. And we must be honest, it served us well, and our lives would not, not look the same without it. But what happened since then? Well, as you can see, the worldwide production of plastic has been growing dramatically since the 1950s. Even half of all plastics ever made are produced during the last 15 years. But what does this mean for the near future? This is how the plastic production figures look like for the coming 30 years. It will almost quadruple compared to the 2014 figures. Nobody is able to foresee the consequences of this immense growth. Now, let's have a look at the bigger picture here. This year, we reached the level of 360 million tons of produced plastic. 
50% of the plastics produced turn into single-use products instantly. These products have a use time or work time of approximately 15 minutes. Consumers worldwide use an average of 146 kilos single-use plastics annually. It's not going well, I think. Well, plastics have a lifespan of approximately 500 to 1,000 years. A simple plastic bag can last forever, for that matter. So, what does that mean for the plastic soup in the oceans? Well, research shows that plastic accounts for 60 to 70 percent of the total ocean waste. That's an enormous amount. But the numbers are even worse in the European seas and also the Baltic Sea. Plastic is present above and sometimes far above 70 percent. Rivers are the main outlets of plastic waste to the ocean. The latest models indicate that coastal areas are responsible for approximately 8 billion kilos of plastic waste entering the oceans annually. This is comparable with a waste truck dumping its load into the ocean every single minute for a whole year. So let's have a look at some plastic soup figures. 10 to 11 million tons of plastic end up in the ocean each year. That's about 3% of the total annual production. 80%, that what was, uh, I was talking about earlier, is waste, of this waste is land-based. Less than 1% of the ocean plastic floats at the surface for a while. The rest disappears under the water surface and eventually will end at the ocean floor. We call it plastic snow. Due to fragmentation, all this plastic eventually ends up as microplastic. 90% of all this plastic becomes smaller than 5 millimeters. And microplastic do not disappear, but they become part of our soil or our ocean soil. So, ah, sorry. I was keeping behind. Oh well. When the plastic pollution problem already starts at the top of the world, the rivers will find a way to get rid of it. And some of this floating plastic will even wash ashore on the other side of the world. It's a crazy situation. But if plastic is so common in the environment, what is then the effect on wildlife? Well, birds try to live with it. This is just a simple example of the many nests made of fresh plastic in Amsterdam. Or they simply don't see the difference with food and starve to death. But also land animals suffer from plastic. This is a quite common picture already. Or, for instance, this horrible picture of a dead cow full of plastic. I can go on and on with loads of examples, unfortunately, or luckily, I have only 50 minutes. But the bottom line is that what we embrace as a highly convenient good is now rapidly unveiling its true character. We are suffocating our world with plastic. So let's take a deep breath and have a look at the possibilities now. We are looking here at an infographic. Global flows of plastic packaging materials. There is a lot of information about the direct negative effects of plastic to the environment at the right of this infographic. The recycling section at the top says that only 14% nowadays 18% of all plastic packaging was re recycled worldwide in 2013, only 14%. When we take a closer look at the circular system, 
for plastic packaging, we can see that it's even far from ideal. Only 2% is actually closed-loop recycled, mostly due to deposit schemes. 8% is cascaded recycled and will never return into the same product as it was. But why is it so hard to recycle plastic? It already starts with an enormous variety in plastic types and appearances. More than 5,000 trade names with all the specific differences. Technically, they are all recyclable, but economically and practically, it's a burden. There are a lot of issues that make it even harder. Collection problems, accumulation of chemicals and additives, quality problems, market positioning, and all sorts of regulations. China is already quite aware of these difficulties and lately has closed its doors for our Western waste. So recycling is not a solution. Mm, not quite. The plastic recycling sector is actually just starting and is evolving slowly. Better systems will turn up eventually, hopefully. The real problem is time. It's just an unrealistic conception that plastic recycling can keep up the pace with the growing plastic production. Despite of the recycling sector's most necessary efforts, we need to undertake other actions. So the best solutions? We have to stop our addiction for plastic, for single-use plastics as soon as possible. We need change on habits for that. Not only our consumption habits, but also the way industry produces and markets their products. Single-use plastic plays a major role in that. Fortunately, new proposals from the EU Commission are pointing at the same direction, so that's a good starting point. This is the only way to stop the plastic tsunami that will confront us in the very near future. A hard task, yes. Definitely, but highly essential. Oops, we haven't talked about microplastics yet. We have to, unfortunately, because it has a big effect on us all. Good to know. Yeah. In general, yes, there it is. If a plastic particle is smaller than five millimeters, it's called a microplastic. So this is a short list of the main sources of microplastic loss. Fragmentation of plastic products, of microplastics. Microplastics in cosmetics and personal care products. Microfibers from clothes and textiles. But also weathering of paint and sanding dust. Or even wear of rubber tires. On average, yeah, I'm also close. On average, we talk about all circumstances surrounding plastic, sunlight, and or friction. For that matter, this simple broom is a source of microplastic loss as well. Fibers from clothes and textiles are a big environmental problem. The Plastic Soup Foundation is part of an extensive research program on this issue. The results are shocking. An average of nine million plastic fibers per five kilograms wash load with synthetic clothes are released. These fibers are found everywhere, around all waters in the world, in the Arctic ice, in tap water, in food, and even in the air. In Paris, researchers even discovered plastic fallout from the sky. And the consequences? There is more and more proof about health issues regarding microplastics especially particles that have spent some time in the environment, get highly polluted and form a bigger risk. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's better. Microorganisms eat these plastics, and they are at the start of our food chain. But also direct consumption habits can have effects and needs to be investigated. I found this sentence 
from Stephen Hawking's about robots, and it struck me because it's easily applicable for plastics, plastics as well. We are being defeated by our own creations, by products that doesn't have a conscience. But if we change products into materials, it fits plastic. So our advice, we have to change our way of consumption and find ways to stop single-use plastics as good as we can. Therefore, product adaptation is important. Strive for higher quality products with a longer life, maybe made from better, from better materials. Fast consumption models should change to more sustainable. Responsibility for the environment will rise with wider availability of better products. And deposit schemes and highly reusable products will make a big change in diminishing plastic waste. So, this is it. I have some practical solutions as well. Or end of pipe solutions, or maybe we should call it damage control solutions. To tackle the main outlet of land-based plastics, we have to find smart solutions for rivers. This is the smartest solution at this moment. A screen of air bubbles that will redirect the floating waste to the riverbanks where it can be collected. This system has no negative effect on fish migration and boats can sail right through. But there are getting more and more solutions for rivers and harbor areas. These all serve specific purposes and are unique on itself. If you are interested, let me know. I'm glad to tell you about it. And the best for last. This is a prototype of a washing machine filter from our Slovenian partner, Planet Care. This filter will re restrain plastic fiber loss from washing up to 80% and is the best solution at this very moment. But I'd like to thank you, uh, sorry, I'd like to end with a quote from uh, Mrs. Sylvia Earle, what's on the cover of the special plastic soup edition of National Geographic magazine. Her quote is, plastics aren't inherently bad. It's what we do or don't do with them that counts. I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and as I uh, invite our panelists, uh, everyone up here now, um, uh, and uh, let me introduce them. Uh, would you guys uh, please take a seat here? We already took our seats and uh, listened here on the stage. Um, I'm, I just have to say, first of all, uh, excuse me for not introducing myself. Uh, my name is Lauri Tankler, and I am a I'm a journalist. Uh, I work for uh, a daily newspaper and online news portal Delphi. And maybe this is also why I have a little little patience for uh, for these um, you know uh, ceremonial things and really want to get to the point uh, because uh, this whole question of of plastics in the uh, in the Baltic Sea uh, and plastic materials, which which is uh, which is polluting our um, our seas, it's it's baffling to me uh, because I don't really understand why haven't we stopped it yet. But uh, we're going to go through this panel in this way. So everybody here uh, is going to have a little bit of a time to to talk about their. Uh, their aspect, their viewpoint on this problem. Uh, we have here uh, five uh, very uh, knowledgeable and important people. Uh, to my left uh, is uh, Ms. Reka uh, Rojavolji. Um, she is uh, from, uh, uh, from the, uh, the, the Mare uh, director, DG Mare, you probably guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, she's a police officer there. Uh, next to her, we have uh, Mr. Harry Mora. Uh, he is uh, the SEI Tallinn program director. Um, then we have Mr. Uh, Mikhail Durkin, uh, Coalition for uh, Clean Baltic. Uh, he is the executive secretary there. Um, next to him, uh, professional secretary of Helcom. Uh, Mr. Dmitry Frank Kamenetsky, and uh, finally uh, from representing uh, the Tallinn uh, 
Tallinn municipal, uh, municipal government is uh, uh, Mr. Gennady Gramberg, uh, who is uh, the head of the uh, environmental projects and education. We're going to go through this uh, uh, in, in this fashion. Everybody here is going to get about five minutes to talk about uh, what, uh, what, they, what they see this problem as and, and how they've, they've seen or how they've dealt with this, uh, with this uh, problem. And we're going to go in this direction that uh, uh, people who are going to raise this problem first and then the ones who are uh, responsible for solutions uh, are going to go last. And uh, let's uh, begin with Mr. Harry Mora. Uh, go ahead. You can just do it right there or uh, up here. Okay, I, I do it here because <clears throat> it's easier and it's very short introduction to the work that uh, we have uh, carried out recently in the frame of the project called Plastic. But that's a good question, you know, why we haven't stopped to pollute the sea. This is uh, always uh, a question which might arise, uh, but of course, I think the first thing is to recognize it, to understand that this is a problem. And as we have already recognized from the previous uh, presenter, that the marine litter issue, especially, especially when it comes to the plastic as, as the major uh, part of the marine litter, is really a problem. It's, this is a problem on a global level, and I feel that it has been started to be recognized also here in the Baltic Sea region. Only a few years ago, this wasn't really an issue, and I think uh, often we didn't recognize it also in the physically in the nature because uh, the, the problem wasn't so visual. So this is, this is the kind of background uh, what we started to recognize the, uh, some years ago when, when we were starting to talk about marine litter, and especially the major part of the marine litter plastic uh, as, as the main major material and the most problematic uh, material in the in the sea because it has, uh, in a way, very positive uh, uh, characteristics, being very durable, uh, lasting long time. It's excellent material for, for producing uh, products. And as we can see also in the Baltic Sea area, in those countries, the consum consumption of plastic uh, goods is, is, is growing all the time. But at the same time, visually, I think we all have also seen that the impact is also growing. I think most of us, we have recognized when walking in the seashores that the plastic waste litter in the seashores, it is increasing and increasing. And it has been really, has been recognized not only by, by people, but also uh, by different organizations and now also by governments. And this was the basis for, for the project that we initiated two years ago, together with uh, eight partners around the uh, Central Baltic area, uh, uh, four countries, uh, uh, Latvia, Estonia, Finland and Sweden, we, we realized that it's time to do something with that, that problem. And the first question is what to do? Who should be the, the actors who take the, the, the stake, so to say? And we, we realized it's not enough to raise awareness, but we have to identi identify the key key actors here, and we, we clearly recognize that uh, local municipalities located to the seacoast, they are the ones who have an excellent opportunity to influence uh, the, the questions related to the uh, reduction of uh, um, uh, marine litter. So it was clear that there, is a, there was a need for a, some sort of structured framework or methodology on how to tackle uh, marine litter question or issue uh, in, a, in a structured way, in a methodological way. So this was something that we developed during this plastic project, the methodology for, for local uh, governments to uh, map the sources of uh, marine litter, to prepare the action plans to tackle the problem and to monitor the issue because these elements are all uh, important to, to have a systematic approach here. And of course, awareness raising, this is something which also needs to be taken into account. And I think uh, local municipalities are very good uh, organizations or central focal bodies who should do that. So based on that, I think, uh, and thanks to the project, uh, we have really developed a framework which can be used now by other municipalities. And this is, I, I think, very good starting point for wider tackling of, of the problem of marine litter and especially, especially the plastic as a, as a problematic material in the aquatic environment. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. The the plastic project uh, is is uh, is an interesting way, and I have like a million questions 
about that project but uh let me just go through these uh this uh, this thing a little bit uh, more uh mikhail durkin uh from the coalition clean baltic uh, uh yes i will probably come right speak here. from there because yes. it would be easier to switch slides at least um and uh, go right ahead yeah uh well i will probably start also with the story uh echoing what harry just said uh we have also started working on the microplastic issue since quite a while after one of our members uh german friends of the earth uh, they looked into uh, microplastics and personal care consumer products and based on their study we have started looking into the, uh, creating lists of uh, cosmetic products that are containing microplastic. And last year we ran uh, a small screening uh, along several of the Eastern Baltic rivers and we actually found quite a lot of uh, microplastic particles uh, in all of those major uh, big uh, Eastern Baltic rivers, starting from Vistula, Nemanos, Daugava, Narva, and even in the lakes uh, far from the sea, like in Belarus and uh, small rivers in Ukraine, we also found microplastic. And that uh, drove our uh, work related to microplastic. Uh, but I would like to be a bit more provocative and um, just to show you the most recent decision by the Swedish government and ask you a question whether it makes sense or not. Uh, as some of you may know, the uh, Swedish government has banned, uh, well, rings of cosmetic products containing microplastic uh, starting from July, 1st July this year. But in fact, on one hand, it only tackles a small portion of the uh, microplastic containing products. And secondly, industry is already quite far uh, away uh, and they are prepared to do that by themselves without e even any enforcement. And then um, uh, I will probably not repeat uh, what was already stated in the keynote speech, uh, but just to make you aware that there is a lot of information now avail available also from European Commission about uh, sources and pathways and streams of uh, microplastic to the uh, oceans and seas. But what is important for us to remember that in fact this irrespective of the sources, uh, those microplastic particles can end up in various uh, media, and that includes soil, that includes uh, water bodies, that includes agricultural land uh, and various waste streams. And also looking at the uh, information presented here on the slide uh, from a rather recent study by Unomia uh, that was published in 2018 based on a report commissioned by uh, DG Environment, uh, you can also see what kinds of uh, industries and sectors are generating those microplastics. And then uh, this is even more uh, important picture to remember. What are the ranges of uh, the amounts coming from those different sources? And that's automotive tires, that's paints, that's uh, textiles and whatnot. And what is actually quite astonishing, and I have attended a, a workshop last week at the European Chemical Agency where we were discussing particularly intentional use of plastics. And uh, talking to the industry, what uh, strokes me most is that industry is just saying that, well, we are not intentionally using microplastic. All what it comes into the environment, that's not our fault. It's the final product that either it is a scratches or patches of uh, paint together with the, uh, uh, the um, surface material that uh, is removed and then it is lost in the, into environment. So industry on one hand, at least some sectors are prepared, like uh, cosmetic and detergent industry. They are at least getting aware and getting prepared for, for doing something, but uh, many others are not yet. Uh, and at the regional level, uh, there are a number of actions that are uh, taken, uh, and I will not take uh, the word from Dmitry later on, but uh, those points that are highlighted here with red, in fact, they are standing for those measures that are still not resolved. And for example, that stormwater management and microplastic from stormwater releases, that's uh, advanced wastewater treatment techniques uh, that we need even in this region with quite good uh, level of wastewater treatment in general. Uh, and that's of course also work related to eco-design and uh, substitutes and replacement of microbeads or microplastic or microparticles in different pros products and processes. Luckily, there are several policies that are ongoing both at the European as well as global level and uh, there are some news now coming from uh, UN Environmental Assembly uh, saying that perhaps to address the matter, not only microplastic but also macroplastic and marine litter in general, we need a separate convention to be put in place. And also very good news from European Commission, despite some of the critique, especially from environmental NGOs, both about the plastic strategy as well as the proposal for a directive to uh, 
fight against particularly single-use plastic. Uh, and the most recent news, uh, at least that what I've learned uh, last week, that ECA, European Chemical Agency, is preparing a dossier on potential restrictions on microplastics. Uh, likewise, at the regional level, I already mentioned, and we may expect even further um, work to be done. But what is very important is that the industry needs to change, and the industry needs to completely rethink the whole idea of how to use plastic in their production cycle. And for that, we need certainly more or less an industrial revolution. Because even uh, judging from a campaign that was uh, launched this year, uh, whether a person can live without plastic for just 40 days. It proves that it is not as easy. So, what we can do, uh, perhaps, is to make people aware and make, it, uh, m make the use of plastic in this way, making those toys uh, out of the marine litter. But what we, do, what we do need to do all together is to fight against plastic at each single moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this uh, this brings me to uh, Dmitry Frankomelsky. Um, can you please uh, give us a small overview of what Helcom is uh, is 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 doing, and then what do you know uh, that uh, other others are doing to actually combat this yeah. uh, this problem? Thank you so much, and thank you, Mikhail. You left something to speak. <laughs> me also. Uh, Probably starting the story, I would um, start from a ministerial meeting, which happened, a Helcom countries ministerial meeting, which happened this March. And I would say that I can hardly recall a single country which wouldn't mention Marin leader within the top priorities. I think two top priorities were mentioned by all countries, which were eutrophication and plastic. Oh, not plastic, merry litter. Uh, on the other hand, each country saw the problem at different angle, own angle. Uh, some countries, they emphasize the need to obey floating litter and beach litter. Other countries focused on threat caused by ghost nets, lost fishing gear, uh, the Others emphasized importance to mitigate microplastics. So it all indicated the diversity of the types of the plastics. <clears throat> of course, diversity of the sources and pathways and diversity of the measures which are to be implemented in order to mitigate littering of the marine environment. Good news is that almost all these issues found their reflection in Helcom Marine Litter Action Plan, which was adopted two years ago in 2016, and uh, which covers almost all the actions which might be implemented in order to mitigate litter in marine environment, either on land or on sea, and also, which is extremely important, it includes a specific chapter devoted to uh, education and promotion of the environment. But the main thing, how to follow up, how to see the results of the implementation. In Helcom, we used to organize this follow-up through indicators of good environmental status. And Helcom already suggested three indicators. One is our pitch leader, uh, seafloor litter and uh, micro litter. But none of them actually reached the status of core indicator, mainly due to lack of um, proper or regionally harmonized monitoring methodology. <coughs> and this is the main task with which the expert society is struggling. Uh, I would say that we are very close, and I hope that. Uh, the uh, methodology to monitor uh, beach litter will be already adopted in this June, and then we will be able to elaborate a baseline for the current status and uh, set reduction targets and good environmental status thresholds. The most complicated is uh, microplastic. 
So we have already seen that the sources are multiple. And actually, the each plastic item ends up being disintegrated into the microparticles. That is why now Helcom Expert Society is really struggling to elaborate har har harmonized methodology uh, to monitor uh, microparticles, to identify major sources and pathways, and then suggest appropriate measures. For we well know then wrong measures in wrong place is the worst we can do. Um, based on that, Helcom ministers, oh sorry, ministers of countries, <laughs> which are Helcom contracting parties, they actually committed three very simple things, ah, simple in a nutshell, but they're written quite long in the declaration. Uh, they are first to elaborate a harmonized monitoring methodologies based on the most uh, recent sci uh, scientific knowledge. The second one, set up ambitious but feasible reduction targets and good environmental status. And the third, this is specific, specific task aimed at microplastic to elaborate proper knowledge, ba knowledge base to organize monitoring, identification pathways and sources, and then based on it to suggest proper measures. Uh, this is like in three words, major outcomes of the ministerial meeting, what is committed in Helcom society to do. The only two things I would like to add to that, that ministers, uh, first of all, all recognize that Helcom is actually world forerunner in this issue in general and should keep this role. So the region is the most promoted in this respect. And uh, the other thing that the role over all stakeholders in this particular problem and mitigation of this problem is, uh, so to say, uncountable. So all stakeholders, mainly municipalities, uh, NGOs, all members of the Baltic Sea family are to be involved in the uh, finding and joint work, joint effort to solve the problem. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, next up, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Reka Rajavorji. That's correct. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation on behalf of, on behalf of the European Commission uh, and DG Mare in particular, which is uh, dealing with maritime affairs and fisheries. Indeed, uh, as we have seen already, uh, the facts uh, are just overwhelming. More than 8 million tons of plastic is dumped into our oceans every year. The graphical illustration shows the number of species found with marine litter, and the numbers are increasing. And although plastic can be fantastic, as we have seen in the keynote presentation, it is a grand societal challenge that we all have to share uh, as a responsibility. So what are we doing about uh, this grand challenge at the European Commission? We have last year organized a major global event called Our Ocean Conference in Malta. And this event gathered together stakeholders from all over the world. And we have managed to actually gather more than 100 commitments out of 437 commitments that were actually specifically targeting marine pollution and plastics. 29 states also made commitments in this, con uh, in this conference, including Baltic states as well, such as Germany, Sweden and Denmark. And most importantly, for the very first time in the series of the Our Ocean Conference, the EU, uh, we managed to gather businesses on board uh, to mobilize the corporate sector for the very first time uh, at large scale uh, in ocean conservation. So on this slide, you actually see some concrete examples of pledges, concrete, impactful and tangible commitments made by businesses. For example, Coca-Cola announced that it will make all its consumer packaging 100% recyclable by 2025. And Marks and Spencer announced that all its plastic packaging will be 100% recyclable and widely recycled by 2022. So these were really powerful, concrete commitments in support of uh, healthy and clean oceans. 
Now, uh, although we are very proud to have organized this uh, successful conference, we are not sitting on, on our laurels for the time being. We are actually uh, about uh, to initiate a, a new legislative proposal, a new directive, which uh, some of the speakers before me already mentioned. So this is a part of the EU strategy uh, on plastics, which was announced in January this year. And uh, we are about to propose uh, two concrete uh, legislative uh, proposals, uh, one targeting uh, the 10 uh, single-use plastic products that are most often found on Europe's beaches and seas, and the other item that we are targeting with this new legislative uh, proposal, a directive, is uh, a lost and abandoned fishing gear. Fishing gear in particular uh, is a major source of uh, marine litter. Alone in the EU uh, seas, 27% uh, of the marine litter is actually made up of uh, uh, plastic-related uh, uh, fishing gear. So our intention with uh, uh, this uh, proposal is to counteract uh, the current trend whereby actually only a very small proportion of waste, fishing gear, plastic, is recycled in the EU, whilst in other countries, for example, Norway and Iceland, a much higher proportion of the gear is collected. For example, 90% uh, of the gear is claimed uh, to be collected in Iceland. So systematically, in the EU, uh, although improvements in the Port Reception Facility Directive and the Fisheries Control Regulation, uh, if enacted and implemented properly, should lead to an improvement of the returning of the gear to shore, as well as reporting on losses, and as part of an overall improvement of treating of waste in ports, more and better action on disposing of waste gear once returned. Here, the key word is producer responsibility. What we want to achieve with this new legislative proposal is that we want to put the burden of the additional cost that is generated by the treatment of the fishing gear once it's brought to the shore to the producer of that fishing gear, the plastic-related fishing gear. So we want to in introduce an extended producer responsibility scheme with this fishing gear regulation. So I talked about uh, past achievements uh, at the level of the EU. I talked about future legislative proposals. What I also need to tell you is that on an ongoing basis, uh, we have been engaging uh, with the help of EU funds in concrete projects such as the Blastic uh, project as well, which is a prominent uh, example, but plenty of other projects that I could have uh, brought here and talked about it for, for hours. I just wanted to highlight uh, three concrete examples. Uh, one is the Baltic Phoenix uh, project, uh, which aims to effectively improve the nutrient recycling in the Baltic Sea region. And another project that is called the Circular Ocean Project, uh, which was actually the winner of the Regio Stars Award in 2016. This project aims at developing and sharing and testing new sustainable solutions to incentivize the collection and reprocessing of discarded fishing nets and assist the movement towards a more circular economy. Finally, a Horizon 2020 research project that is newly funded uh, called CLAIM, which seeks to develop and apply innovative marine cleaning technologies and approaches in the Mediterranean and in the Black Sea. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. And we are going to, and we're going to end this, uh, this uh, small presentation part of this, uh, this panel with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Gennady uh, Gramberg from the Tallinn municipality uh, and, uh, and your, your view on this, uh, this particular Thank issue. You. Uh, I represent the uh, city of Tallinn, and uh, in the city of Tallinn, we are dealing a lot with the problem of uh, littering, of marine littering, littering, because Tallinn has a quite long coastal line. It's more than 50 kilometers long, and uh, we have also four, um, four sea beaches. Uh, some of them are very popular like Stromi Beach and Pirita Beach. 
So uh, that is why on these beaches gathered a lot of people, and uh, um, it means that uh, um, a lot of littering, a lot of plastic are going to the sea uh, through the beaches. Uh, as you know from statistics, about 70-80% of, uh, of, lit of uh, plastic are going from the coastal area, and especially from the uh, urban coastal area. So uh, Tallinn, uh, the biggest uh, city in Estonia, located on the bank of the Finnish uh, Gulf of Finland. So that is why we are feeling also responsibility uh, for... Um, uh, for taking some actions to prevent uh, littering uh, in the uh, to prevent littering to the Baltic Sea, um, Tallinn, uh, mm, what we can do? Uh, Tallinn is um, not dealing with uh, uh, with the sea because, um, according to our law, uh, the border of uh, municipality finish when the sea water start. So that is why we have to do something on the coastal area. So uh, because our citizens and also tourists are going to, to swim. So that is why they want to, to feel a good quality of water. And um, we, um, we put a lot of um, effort uh, to, the, uh, to the raising of awareness of uh, our citizens about this, and in different way, the project Blastic is uh, one of the ex uh, one of the um, examples um, of this work because in the framework of this project, we organize uh, the public events, uh, and uh, in the framework of this event, we are uh, turn uh, attention of people. Uh, what is uh, about what dan how dangerous is is littering, and one of the biggest uh, events in this regard is our um, uh, big cleanup event on the on the on one of the biggest uh, swimming uh, beach of the city on the Stromi uh, Stromirand, and um, every every spring, in the framework of our campaign of spring cleaning up campaign. This is one of the oldest campaign in the in the city of Tallinn. We provided uh, 27 years, uh, 27 years, and uh, last years this big cleaning up action became also international in our area. Our good uh, partners from Helsinki, from uh, and one of them I already see here, from Helsinki, from Turku, from uh, Saint Petersburg, also joined us. And already for years, we organize our joint cleaning up uh, actions on the beach, uh, on the beach of the Baltic Sea, and uh, hundreds of people are coming uh, on, on different areas of our cities and collect um, garbage. Most of them is uh, different kinds of uh, plastic there, but we we don't we do not. Um, invite people only to collect because we, some, we have some companies who specialize in this uh, in cleaning but we invite people to come and to see what people what people remain on the beaches and how dangerous it is and those actions actions are connected with different uh, um, educational activities and for example this year in spring um, in the beginning of of may we had such action also on the Stromi beach. About 500 people um, participated. We cleaned this uh, coastal area, collected 20 uh, tons of different waste from this area. Is, uh, but we did not on collect. But after we showed to the people how dangerous it is through the entertainments, through the different uh, um, activities, also posters prepared by our uh, colleagues from uh, partners from uh, say etc this is one of the examples and we have different kinds of activities in schools also even in uh, kindergartens because it's very necessary to educate also kids about littering so when they grow up became adults 
and they have, will have of their own families when they go to the beach, they will know uh, that they have to behave very correctly and collect all their garbage and, uh, and bring away. And last thing that I want to mention that the city of Tallinn uh, adopted, the Council of City of Tallinn adopted uh, waste management uh, action plan until um, two th two th 2023. And uh, we now, we, at least our department, do not permit on our um, events to use plastic, any kind of plastic. And that is why it's a little bit uh, ex expensive, but we are ready to pay more, but to eliminate all kind of plastic on our activity. This big event on Stromi Rand was one of the examples because there were no any plastic here. Even bags which people used to collect the garbage, it, they were not from plastic. They were from, uh, I would say, that in Estonia we use it when we go to to pick up uh, potatoes. So we use this kind of, uh, of bags. So uh, this is the main uh, task of municipality to raise people's envi uh, environment um, awareness about plastic and how dangerous it is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so let's let's uh, let's be honest. Uh, we we do have uh, some time for discussion right now, um, and uh, even if we don't have as much time as we thought we would, um, you guys who are right now listening in on in the audience, uh, and may uh, we may not be able to take all the questions that that are you, you just come up to these people afterwards and ask them you know it's 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 also that that simple but uh, let me just Gently. as we're here up here in the panel right now let me let me ask everyone to pitch in with with uh, this this sort of a, a broad question and i'm going to go one by one but the broad question is is to to people who are who are working with um, uh, with the activist groups and with the environmental groups what should be done if there is let's say literally um you know uh unlimited amount of money or unlimited amount of uh of of political capital you know we've we've tackled we're, we're we haven't tackled but we're tackling climate change through this paris agreement and and there's there's uh, european union is putting stuff so so much uh, so much effort into doing these things um and and yet we're we're in this, in this, on this other side, we're we're doing still. We're talking about littering and and this whole environmental question. Um, and uh, and everyone who is is not on the environmental uh, activism side, uh, why why can't these why can't we find this money or this this energy from from the government gov governance side to, to help this uh, happen. I understand Tallinn is already helping this happen little by little and uh, and the European Commission has their projects and also commitments from uh, different companies. But but still the question is how, wh why so little, it seems to me. But but let me just go, go by one, one by one. Harri um, Mora, the, the plastic, the plastic uh, project you said was uh, was something that was uh, was to uh, to find sources and pathways. Uh, no, not so, um, to basically see how how does litter end up in the water. So, if you found something, why aren't you telling the police about it? That hey, these guys <laughs> are 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 doing those bad things, and and they're still, they'll shut it down. Yeah, good question. Uh, well. Often this marine litter issue has been dealt by researchers so that they do their very academic research work. Most often they publish the results, but the results are then the question who will use them. It's always a question if decision makers, politicians will take up and use it. I, I hope this is the case and it has happened already. But I think the other appro approach would be that you you do it together with the, the key stakeholders. So you really involve the key stakeholders. In our case, we really involve the local municipalities because I think they are the key, key um, let's say the, they provide the framework, the best framework which can 
really be the basis for involving the different stakeholders, starting from uh, households, uh, citizens, and so on. So I think uh, it's important that you do it in an easy way, hands-in, so that you really can show practically to everybody what is the problem and how to tackle it. It's without really understanding the problem and the nature of the problem, it's difficult to involve people or any other stakeholders to, to solve it. So I think uh, uh, there is no question. Of course, you can, uh, you can follow the approach of punishing and really using this type of approach, which earlier, in especially in our country, was very often used. I think that this is not the right way. Mm. I think it's better nowadays to really involve the different levels, starting from decision makers, but let's say also the city, municipality, authority people who actually work on that area, and, and then citizens, and then really involve them and showing them by using an easy methods, not very academic and difficult uh, graphs and figures, but really physically showing them the problem. I think this is the best way to, to tackle the problem. It's, uh, it's difficult for me to understand because I'm not in this scientific community. I'm a journalist and I see solutions as very simple all the time. Uh, actually, they're very complex, I understand. But uh, Gennady, uh, did Plastic show you where the litter is coming from and what did Tallinn do about it? Uh, a survey that was provided in the framework of uh, Oblastic gave a very interesting result. We expected this result, but uh, we did not expect that it's so, <laughs> so, um, so unexpected hmm. because of uh, the, the huge number of this plastic, which uh, research is founded, for example, in the, city, in the river of Pirita. So, it's one of the biggest rivers in our city, not, cannot compare with Neva River, for example, but anyway, it's uh, one of the biggest river which is uh, flowed into the uh, Tallinn Gulf and then to the Gulf of Finland. Um, of course, it's, um, it stimulates our uh, thinking about what we have to do with, with our citizens, how to explain them more, um, more clearly and to show them that this garbage collected from the river, from the beaches, uh, this garbage should not be there because it was bring not by, uh, by aliens or s somebody else, but people who live in this city, they brought this garbage here and they, they, they left there. So that is why this uh, educational work for us um, it's very important, and those researches, they give us facts that we can show to the people and to see. Uh, last year, we, mm, we, we, we did our small research, so when we collected this garbage on the beach, so we made a photos, it was also in cooperation with Helsinki and Turku, and we made photos, and from these photos we made the posters, and in the center of the city, on the Vabaduse, uh, square in the tunnel, we made an exposition with um, uh, 20, 21 posters with very um, <laughs> uh, with pictures which show that pe what people found on the beach. Yes, um, I think this is something that you can do with microplastics, not with micro uh, particles. Uh, uh, Mikhail, um, you heard how. Uh, Reka was speaking about commitments by by different uh, different companies who are talking about their recycle uh, how how their uh, packaging is recyclable and so on. What do you expect uh, the the companies who are doing the uh, um, all these all these products? Uh, how what do you want them to do, or what do you want? I don't know, the European Commission to force them to do so that uh, they wouldn't be uh, polluting our seas with microparticles. Well, uh, thank you, Lauri. And we've heard about the commitment by Coca-Cola, for example, uh, trying to replace uh, most of their packaging towards the recyclable ones. But on the other hand, we know also that Coca-Cola decided not to replace uh, their single-use straws, drinking straws. And that's unfortunately not a good side of uh, more or less the same t commitment. So this would be a simple, very simple step, what they can do. 
Uh, but that's just one example. And uh, then talking about specific industries and specific sectors, like for example, paint, paints and inks. Uh, there are plenty of paints around us that contain plastic. And basically, maybe not everyone is aware, but uh, currently most of the uh, paints are containing different polymers and plastics in one or another form. Uh, those are used also for safety reasons, for example, in some cases, like uh, uh, adding some particles or fibers uh, for marine paints. Yes, we do understand that. But on the other hand, there are alternatives and substitutes that can be easily replaced instead of using microbeads or microfibers. So there are ways to do that. And uh, that's not only about painting sector, of course, but it can be extended to many others. Thank you. Um, Reka, mm -hmm. um, do you think the commission should uh, force companies to to actually take uh, take a lot more action you we've seen commitments by different uh, companies that they voluntarily said that hey we're going to do this we're going to show that we're uh you know we're we're responsible we 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 have this respons responsibility and we're going to show us as the good guys now some big companies have the money to do this some don't and some don't want to do you think the European Commission has the, let's say, moral authority uh, to, or, or the idea to actually um, force companies to do things like we do, for example, on climate change, where we tell car companies to reduce their emissions and, and so on and so forth? Well, definitely with the introduction of the new legislative uh, initiative, the directive that I mentioned earlier, uh, with which we would like to tackle the 10 uh, single plastic use items that are most common and most commonly found uh, in EU waters. We definitely want to shift the burden to producers, so companies that are in charge of actually producing the plastic component of those 10 single uh, use plastic items. So here we are talking about, you know, plastic cotton buds, uh, basically the sticks for, for balloons, such items. Uh, and, and the idea is that uh, whenever uh, we have a, let's say, an existing material that can replace uh, such a single-use plastic, we want to actually ban that product in the market. Where there's an affordable alternative product, we ban uh, that single-use plastic. That's the idea behind. If there's behind. no alternative, and if there is affordable, no, then the legislative initiative uh, basically tries uh, to incentivize consumers to reduce their consumption of that particular item. Mm -hmm. For example, wet uh, towels, you know, wet wipes, uh, things like that. And also what we want to ensure is that the producer, again, the producer, so the company of that plastic material, will be held responsible for the, let's say, treatment of that uh, waste material, mm -hmm. including the, the, the cleanup uh, and all the uh, additional costs. So yes, there is an additional cost for sure for businesses that we want to impose with this concrete legislative proposal. At the same time, we see it also as an economic opportunity for those businesses, because what happens is they will have to really think about innovative solutions to find new materials, to find uh, innovative uh, designs, new packages uh, to actually replace the previously uh, used items. So there is a huge potential for innovation, for job creation, new business models, new business ideas. So that's the way we see it. And from the consumer's point of view, we also see, of course, uh, a cost reduction mm -hmm. just by basically not uh, using uh, that uh, single use item. You have cost reductions on the consumer side. What you have as an increased cost is basically the washing costs involved because, you know, you don't uh, just throw away your plastic uh, cutlery anymore. You can use your own metal uh, cutlery, but you will, you will have to wash it, obviously. So there is this kind of uh, trade-off between uh, comfort and, uh, and environmental responsibility. So, yeah, washing up is tough. Let me put it this way. Exactly. And if I may just uh, add one, one line on that. So we, we talked about EU initiatives. Uh, we talked about the Our Ocean Conference. 
What is also important, I think, to, to recognize is that there has been a, a strong movement recently, a huge momentum in support of safeguarding the oceans for future generations, uh, which was clearly manifested uh, with the series of the Our Ocean Conferences mm -hmm. that started already in 2014. But also last year, there was a major event, a UN event in New York, in June, uh, the Ocean Conference, so the SDG 14 event, and I think we have to definitely mention the Sustainable Development Goals and the implementation of the Sustainable, sustainable Development Goals, which is a shared responsibility. <coughs> These are universal goals. It's not one country, it's not the EU, it's not one uh, citizen that should implement it. We should implement it together, all of us, including businesses as well. And another positive uh, development uh, that, that that we can acknowledge is, of course, also the multilateral fora, not just the UN SDG process, but also the G7, the G20 process. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, under the German presidency, uh, we, we had the action plan on marine litter. Now, uh, under the Canadian presidency, the G7 clearly uh, highlighted oceans as a, as a focal uh, theme. Um, so I think uh, I, I'm a bit more positive. I just wanted to challenge your yeah, initial I understand. I'm, uh, pessimistic statement. I'm very uh, pessimistic still because I like action plans. I totally like strategies, but I just really want to see people actually picking up the litter. Um, and that actually brings me to <laughs> that actually brings me to uh, Dimitri. Uh, you've seen how different uh, countries, different ministers from Helcom countries, and uh, they've they've said that yes, we are totally behind this action plan, and we are totally we totally want to do this. How much money do they pledge, and how much money should uh, how 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 big of a percentage is of that? money that you in your head can imagine that this whole problem would cost well <laughs> <laughs> so we're we policy may regional policy maker but not accountant no uh, i understand we, we, we it's just not, that, we don't, that this, these yeah. sorts of issues they take money they take resources somebody has to pay for this <coughs> i i would suggest uh, in in the beginning you ask that what would we do having uh, unlimited yes. financial or political resources. May I ask for a drop of goodwill? Mm -hmm. Then I would immediately utilize it for one task, one okay. <laughs> challenge to immediately change change our minds of our citizens to responsible humans. Actually, <laughs> uh, it is very easy and very feasible to leave no, to, yeah, I would say differently, to not pay the sea for those environmental services by this leader. And yeah, that's the, the one of the, what, what can we see actually? Uh, we, we can see that a lot of the majority, 50%, 40% leader comes from the beach, from recreation. Uh, we can calculate uh, the top items I identified. That's single-use uh, plastic. These cigarette butts um, are some, yeah, ma mainly the, uh, and uh, plastic packs. So they are just super top priorities, and everything is just left by people on the beach. Uh, the other important issue from our side is, of course, this is uh, microplastic. It's uh, of course, beyond just a simple human behavior. Mm -hmm. Here, we definitely need resources, and they are allocated. I would never even comprehend how much resources are allocated in the whole uh, region, but this is the study, how to properly monitor uh, microplastic. So it's quite... The, uh, the uh, types of over, over particles are very different, so I wouldn't dive deep into this discussion. I'm a chemist in my background, so uh, it's quite diverse types of substances and different methods how to identify them. So to find a feasible solution how to monitor constantly microparticles in water, those microplastics, is quite a challenge. So in having harmonized methodology would help us to identify the sources, the pathways, and then implement measures. All right. I, um, I suppose that because everybody here in the audience is in some way 
there's a reason you guys are here. You guys are, in a way, uh, connected to this whole uh, topic and theme. You have questions, and I am not going to uh, stand in the way of your questions, and I'm not going to stand in the way of you going to dinner. So uh, we're going to do it uh, very simply. You have questions, come up to these guys. Ask them questions. And everybody who is uh, about to go and eat something, then I think uh, you are free to go. And we're going to wrap this up uh, just like that. Give a big round of applause to our headline speaker <laughs> and our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh